Well, first of all, good morning, Professor McGrath. Um, we would like to thank you for being here in University Francisco de Vitoria and for having the opportunity of taking this interview with us. It's a privilege to have you here and to be able to ask you a couple of questions. So I will start directly. Uh, the first question that I would like to ask you is about science and religion. Um, what does really mean to say that there is a dialogue between uh, two disciplines that have uh, such different metho metho uh, methodologies? Uh, how would you explain this? I think that there are many disciplines that are important, for example, the natural sciences, ethics, politics, social studies, and of course, theology and religion. And when you look at any of those disciplines, they use different methodologies. And so if you're going to say that we all have to use the same methodology before we can have a dialogue, then in effect we are preventing a dialogue from any disciplines at all. And in reality, the situation is that we, we make amends, we allow for the fact that we use different ways of thinking. For example, when we're doing science, when we're doing ethics. So there would be no difficulty, for example, in a biologist saying, I'm a socialist. In effect, they've integrated their science and their politics using different methods, yes. But on the other hand, this is perfectly acceptable for a thinking human being. So I think the important thing to appreciate is that we can have these dialogues across disciplinary boundaries, even when these disciplines use different methodologies. So why is this particular dialogue between science and religion so important? Well, I think there are several reasons, and one of them is this, that in today's culture, science is very important and religion is very important for many as well. And if these are so significant elements in contemporary culture, surely it makes sense for them to try and talk to each other, to try and share their insights, to try and present their perspectives on topics of importance, like, for example, the environmental crisis, like global warming and so on. So pragmatically, it is very important, but it's not limited to pragmatism. It's about intellectual enrichment. It's about realizing that each discipline, because it has a very specific methodology and a very precise focus, can only look at certain aspects of reality. And therefore, in many ways, what we want is some way of being able to bring multiple perspectives together so that, in effect, we're able to combine the insights we receive from different disciplines. And that, to me, gives us a richer and a deeper way of thinking. So we might think, for example, of the idea of using different maps, that different uh, disciplines offer us different maps of reality which help us understand certain aspects, but only certain aspects. And in effect, what we need to do is take the maps of the world produced by each intellectual discipline and see if we can combine them, superimpose them, and look at the resulting picture which is going to be richer and deeper than any of these individually. But uh, it's like every part of the reality, um, um, you can see it as a unity, no? but there's no dialogue between them, because if um, there's different methodologies, how um, can they dialogue? That's my, my question. I, I understand the, the proposal of uh, looking everything as a whole, like a synthesis of knowledge, but um, what does it mean when we say that they dialogue between Thank them? Thank you. Well, that, that's a very good question. So let, let's go back to that point you made. Let's talk about methodology. What happens is that each distinct intellectual discipline has a particular intellectual engagement. It's looking at some aspect of reality. And what it finds is that in order to to undertake its research, it has to develop its own methodology which is adapted to that specific task. In other words, the methodology arises from a process of engagement with reality. And it's not a question of assuming in advance that we know how we do this. The methodology emerges as you engage with it. And so, for example, chemistry, physics, and biology actually have different methodologies, even though they're all natural sciences, but it's because they're investigating different aspects of the natural world. So the important point to make is that a methodology which may work well for biology 
will not work well for chemistry or for ethics or for theology because these are different disciplines with different tasks. And so the point I'm making is that methodology is determined by the intellectual task. So what we can do is take the outcomes of these engagements and work at that level. In other words, it's not so much we have to share a methodology. How could we? Because we are doing different things. It's that we're each taking our own methods appropriate to our own areas of investigation and then saying, well, I found this and you found that. Let's talk about what we found and see if combining the outcomes of these investigations helps us to do this kind of process of integration that is so important for us today. What do you think science has to offer to religion and vice versa? What can religion offer to science? I think that's a very good question and of course a dialogue is not simply about one person telling another person what is right, it's about people sharing insights and both growing as a result of this. So what might religion or theology learn from science? I think there are two things that seem to me to be very important. One of them is a love for nature, a real sense of wonder or excitement at the natural world around us. And I think that's very important for religious people as well, because if you take a Christian doctrine of creation seriously, then appreciating the beauty of nature actually is also about appreciating the greater beauty of God. So I think that's, that's the first point. But I think the second point is, is more important, and that is this, that the natural sciences focus on the importance of evidence. In other words, you cannot just say, I think this. You have to be able to say, I have reasons, I have evidence for thinking that this is right. And I think the theology need, needs to hear that, that actually we, we can give very good reasons for saying we believe this about God, or we believe this about Jesus Christ, but we have to be able to show what those reasons are, to show that these are grounded in something deeper and not simply ideas that we've invented or simply received unquestionably from other people. So I think that's certainly something that theology and indeed religion in general can learn from science. What do you think religion can contribute to science nowadays? I think that in a dialogue, both sides of the dialogue are really important. So it's good for scientists to listen to what religion is saying. I think that there are some very interesting points that we could make here. One of them is this, that it's very natural for a scientist to say that reality is limited to what the scientific method can discover. I want to begin by saying how important science is. That's really important. But nevertheless, reality is bigger than science is able to investigate. In other words, that science uses certain tools of investigation which discover so many interesting things, but only some. And there's a lot more that needs to be said. And one of the things I'd want to say is that religion begins to supplement science, to add more and say, look, we need to talk about things like the meaning of life, the value of life, questions like that, which science doesn't really answer, but are nevertheless important for us as human beings. And certainly science is very, very good at helping us to understand how things function, how things work. But you and I need more than that. We need to understand what they mean and, of course, what we mean as well. So that's one thing I'd want to say. The other thing is to say that, um, for example, Christianity gives us an intellectual framework which allows us to, to explain why science is so successful, and that's important, but also helps us to see that by its very nature, science is incomplete. In other words, there are certain things that lie beyond its scope. And that gives a, a possibility of enrichment of each of them in this dialogue. What do you mean when you say that Christianity uh, helps us to understand the importance of science? Because it gives us this framework of a universe, a vast, beautiful, regular universe, which we can investigate. We can uncover some of the laws that, that make it function. And sometimes we, we find science doesn't really quite capture the beauty of creation. But the universe is about more than just things happening. It's about what is, what is the meaning of this? What is, is it here for? And so what theology does is to give us this rich, big picture of reality, which is about a universe which functions regularly, and science can help us understand that 
but also it's something beautiful and important. And we need to understand how we fit into the universe. And in many ways, that's where religion begins to say we matter. We are not, if I can put it like this, meaningless. We are not um, accidentally present in this universe. There's something you and I are here for, we're meant to do, and it gives a vision of who we are and the difference we can make. In your book, Surprised by Meaning, you talk about being amazed or surprised by reality. You just uh, talk about it. Um, do you think uh, that is something we are losing in our society, this um, ability to be amazed uh, for the things that happen or for the world that, that in what we live on? And if it's so, what can we do to bring it back? I think we are in danger of losing this sense of wonder. I think that there may be two things going on here. One of them is over-familiarity. In other words, we, we are so used to certain things happening that we lose our sense of wonder. We, we, we see the, the stars in the night sky, and the first time we do that, we are overwhelmed with a sense of wonder and amazement, but the next time it doesn't seem quite so exciting, and then it just begins to dwindle, to become less and less important. That's one reason, familiarity. The other is a sense of cynicism. You know, you know what, so what? I mean, I mean uh, it doesn't really mean anything. Maybe I do experience a sense of wonder, but it's not significant. And I think both of these are important. With the first one, I think we need to do try and recover a sense of wonder. Try and um, appreciate that even the fact that you and I are here today talking, talking about nature, talking about science, actually is something very strange and very wonderful. I think we need to rediscover just how important that is. But more importantly, I think, we also need to move away from this sense of cynicism. I think what we need to do is almost um, say to ourselves that, um, that there, there's a need for us to get excited about discovering things, about thinking thoughts, about, in effect, being able to make sense of the world around us and finding that this helps us to live more meaningfully. And certainly for me, these are really important things, and I hope very much that something can be done about this. And how we can learn this? How can we learn this? I think there are two ways we can learn this. One is by talking to people who have known this experience. In other words, they were amazed by nature, then they got used to it and they lost that sense of wonder, and then something happened to enable them to recover it. We can ask them, what was it that happened? But the other thing we can do, I think, is even more interesting. It is, in effect, a, a, almost like a deliberate attempt on our part to rediscover something that we've lost. It, it's, it's what um, the British philosopher Aris Murdoch calls attentiveness attentiveness. In effect, it's saying I I'm looking at a tree and instead of just saying there's a tree, I become interested in the tree. I focus on it. I try and appreciate its beauty, its complexity. Uh, and in doing that, in really forcing myself to look for these things, I will find those things. And as a result, my appreciation for the tree or the beauty of the ocean or the night sky, all of these things will increase. So in many ways, it's about a, a suggestion that we we look at the world with a new curiosity, a new attentiveness to try and rediscover something that really is there, but nevertheless we've lost. Atheist culture today is made up of some very intelligent people, yet you could say that they are making fundamental errors of inquiry. What would you say those errors are? Well, I used to be an atheist myself. And so transitioning from being an atheist to being a Christian was really very significant. And when I was an atheist, I did feel that religious belief was unreasonable, that it was irrational. But I now realize that, in effect, that was a, a serious misjudgment and misreading of a complex situation. I think what I'd want to say is that I have no difficulty in accepting that there are many atheists, very intelligent people, who look at the world and do not see any meaning, they do not see any signs of God. And there's an image from the philosopher Wittgenstein that I found very helpful in thinking about this. And in his philosophical investigations, he says this, a picture held us captive 
and we could not break free from it. A picture held us captive and we could not break free from it. And what he means by that is that we are looking at the world through a predetermined picture. And we have the impression this is the only way of looking at things and it limits what we can see. It tells us what we should expect to see and we see that, but we don't see anything else. And in one way, Wittgenstein is saying, look, imagine you're at a picture gallery, okay, and you're walking around and you're looking at not so much works of art, but different ways of looking at the world. And you realize two things. First of all, I've got my way of looking at the world, but there are others. And maybe there are others which might be better than the one I've got. And for me, one of the things that I think impressed me about Christianity was when I understood what its way of looking at the world was, and I could step into that way of looking at things and look through it, it made more sense than my atheism did. So in other words, it, it's not a question of somebody being clever or, or stupid. It's much more, are we using the wrong tools to look at the world? Is there a better way of seeing the world? Or to, to change image, um, you know, it's like holding a lens up. And you, you imagine you're looking at a lens and the lens is not in focus. Mm -hmm. So you look through it and you see a blur. It doesn't make sense. And then you focus the lens and suddenly things are sharp and clear. And for me, if you like, as an atheist, I saw a blurry reality. There was no meaning. I took a Christian lens and I looked through it. It was sharp. I could see things. And what signs did you discover that make you think that that was a focused image? I think that uh, for me, um, it was really the realization that Christianity gave us this larger vision of reality, which didn't just address questions like, Why is there a world? Why does that world have order and structure? But also began to address some very deep questions of human existence, like why do I experience a sense of desire for something that nothing in this world really seems able to satisfy? In other words, it was able to engage experience, my own experience, and not just the world as it was. And so it was a question, if you like, of, of Christianity explaining more, helping me to see a, a bigger intellectual landscape than my earlier atheism. In the context of technology and intelligence, artificial intelligence, where the um, machines are becoming like men and men are becoming like machines, um, do you think that the fundamental questions are going to be over? I think that recent technological developments are raising some very important questions that we, we can't answer at the moment. But one of the things we can say is this, that one of the difficulties is that human beings develop technologies very often for very good reasons, to help us become better people. And then some people discover you can use these technologies to do other things. They can become weapons. And so for me, one of the big ethical dilemmas, which I talk about in this book, is that science enables us to do things which we weren't able to do before. And we can use these in good ways, we can use them in bad ways. For example, every medical development is very important. It can be used to heal people, but it can also be used to kill. Because you understand how the human body functions, and you can work out how to stop the human body functioning. So that, that really is a danger. And so for me, and, and I talk about this in one of the chapters in this book, all these questions come back to us, us as human beings. Why are we so clever and yet do some very silly things? Why do we have wars? Why is there poverty? And in many ways, it keeps coming back to this issue that we are moving in new directions but it's still us as human beings who keep making mistakes, who, who tend to be a bit selfish and do things you know, which don't work out very well. So how do we cope with the moral ambiguity of human beings when we're able to do so much? And one writer once put it like this, the problem is, he said, that human beings are rapidly moving to space age technology, but stone age morality. How can we learn to live with that? I talk about that in the book, it's a good question. And do you have a, an answer, a proposal to, to this moral um, issue? My answer is we mustn't be utopian. Hey, it's going to be great. We, we, we can do all these new things. It's going to be wonderful. All the world's problems will disappear. They won't. They'll just be new problems. So what we need to do is be very realistic as we confront the future. And certainly some of these technologies will be wonderful and help us. 
but they can also be used for the wrong purposes. We need to be prepared for that. And how do we prepare for that? By we look at what might happen if various things take place. For example, take the internet. I mean, when they invented the internet, it was all about sharing of information. Wonderful! And then we have, for example, in Britain, we have a major problem right now, which is young people committing suicide because they're going to websites that say, you are worthless, there is no point to life, and here is how you can kill yourself. I don't think the people who invented the internet intended that. That's what's happened. So very often we need to deal with unintended consequences of good technological ideas. So I say we need to be alert to human weaknesses and in effect be ready to try and engage these problems as and when they emerge. So the problem is not the technology but the human itself, no? That's the problem. We are the problem. We invent new technologies but we are still here. Dr. McGrath, this is your book in the Spanish edition, Cautivado por el Sentido. I would like to ask you why did you wrote this book and how did you do it? And if you can tell us about the, the content of the book. Thank you. Well, I wrote this book because I felt there was a real need for intelligent thinking people, like university students, to, to be helped to think through this complex question of the relation of science and faith, but in a very accessible way. In other words, it's intellectually rigorous but at the same time it's easy to read. And in many ways it, it addresses some of the key questions you might expect me to address. For example, are science and religion incompatible? Well, no, they're not. They just use different methods, but they help us to get this bigger vision of life which we all need. But it also addresses two questions that I think are really important for university students. One of them is this whole question of um, what is it that we feel able to believe? And this is very important because many, many students feel that the minute you say, um, I believe something, you're implying this is not something that is intellectually reliable. It's just something I kind of hope is right, but I have a sense it might be wrong. And what I need to say in this, what I say in this book is that basically life is like that, that um, there are certain things we can prove to be true and that's wonderful, but very often these things are not that's significant. And when we look at questions that all of us worry about, like what is the meaning of life, or um, how do I live a good life, or why am I here, we find that actually we have to make judgments that cannot be proved to be right. And yet we cannot go through life without making those judgments. We have to say, in my case, I think it is this. And so the book helps you to see that this is normal. And actually, religious, religion is not the exception to the rule. If anything, it establishes the rule, which is we have to believe things that are so important that we cannot prove them to be true, but we live our lives out on the basis of these beliefs. Could you make an example of, of this situation? Well, a very good example is uh, a British philosopher called Bertrand Russell. And back in 1947, I think it was, he, he wrote that the task of philosophy is to help us to live with uncertainty and yet without being paralyzed by hesitation. And what he meant by that is that when you do philosophy properly, you realize that all of life's big questions remain unanswered. And yet we need at least some provisional answers to keep going. And so what Russell is saying is that when you study philosophy properly, it helps you to realize you can give answers to those questions that you can't prove to be right, but you know you've got good reasons. And then you live your life on those basis. And that's really important because Russell actually chose to live his life as an atheist, but he was always clear he couldn't prove that was right. It was his choice. And that, I think, is really significant. That's one of the things I talk about in this book. The other thing which I talk about, which again, I think is really important, is just how this idea of meaning is so important to people. And I used to be a scientist myself, and I love science and still love science. But for me, one of the things that science does not do is it doesn't help us to establish what is good. It doesn't help us to establish why we're here, what we're meant to be doing. And so in many ways, it's saying that we can supplement science. Science tells us how things work, but religion focuses on what things mean. And so we can bring these things together. So in effect, we have this very, very good sense that we know how our universe works, 
and we also have a sense of what it's there for. And to me, that's really important, bringing together functionality and meaning. I mean, for example, I know how I function, biologically and chemically and physically, but I'm more than that. You know, and, and so the question as to what I mean, that's really important as well. So the book really is trying to help its readers see there are some very good questions, and science can answer some, Yes, not all of them. Religion can also answer some, not all of them. It cannot tell us, for example, what the value of the fundamental constants of nature are. But if you have a dialogue between science and religion, it helps you to enrich the weaknesses of both of them. And that really is what this book is trying to do, to show scientists how religion can help them. And also, if you're not a scientist but you're interested in theology, how you can bring these things together and achieve an enriched vision of reality. And in your experience as a professor, what would you say that most interest young people or what are the fundamental questions and they, that they have that you see in, in class? I think I see a number of questions. Let, let me mention one which I think for many of them is, is very important. Many of them are saying we want to be able to make sense of life. We want to know what life means. But we don't just want to believe anything. We want to be sure we are right. How can we believe something when the evidence isn't absolutely conclusive? And why do you think is, they think like that? Because I think they come from a scientific culture which places an emphasis on proof and that's good mm -hmm. but one of the things we have to realize is that the, with life's really important questions mm -hmm. the answers lie beyond scientific proof. We have to learn to live with this tension. So I can prove to you that the chemical form of the water is H2O, and that's good, but that is not exciting. It doesn't help us give uh, you know, a vision for life. It doesn't tell us what life is all about. It doesn't let us live life in a more meaningful way. So one of the things we have to learn to understand is that when we're looking at questions of, for example, moral value, what is good, what is not good, or um, political values, or theology, you know, is there a God? What is God like? All of these things, good answers can be given, but we cannot prove that they are right in the way I could prove to you very, very easily that two and two make four. And as I got older, one of the things I've learned is that the only truths you can prove are shallow truths. And what I mean by that is they're easy to prove, but they don't actually mean very much. And so the, the paradox is that whether you are an atheist or a Christian, whether you are a Marxist or a conservative, you, are, you hold views you cannot prove to be right, but you nevertheless think they're right and think you have good reasons for believing that they're right. And that, that's what I have to try and explain to people is the case, that we have to learn to live with this paradox that we can, we can believe and trust things that we cannot absolutely prove to be right. Mm -hmm. And to finish, one last question. What would you say to professors or students that are starting to ask themselves those fundamental questions, maybe in class in the university, about the meaning of life and don't know where to start, don't know what path um, to follow. What would you say to them? What advice would you give to them? I think the first thing I would say is, is, is don't be cynical. Very often people say, well, there are so many answers to what is the meaning of life, they can't all be right, so they're probably all wrong. Don't be cynical, because it is a very important question, because once you have a sense of who you are and what you're meant to be doing, what life is all about. That helps you set goals. It helps you figure out who you are and what you're meant to be doing. So it's very important to begin by saying how important the question is. The second thing is this, to try and understand what that word meaning actually is all about. And in many ways it's about four things. It's about personal identity. Who am I really? Am I just the some constituents of the different chemical and physical components of my body? Or is there more to me and more to you than that? Then secondly, of course, is this question of value. Not just what is good, how do I find this, but also do I matter? Am I important? I'm, are you important? And how do we learn to realize that we, we matter and as a result we can live life knowing that we are significant? That's very important.
There's also this very important question about purpose. That's the third thing, purpose. Why am I here? Science is very good at answering how questions. How did I come to be here? How did you come to be here? It's not so good about saying, why are we here? And yet that's very important because for many people, trying to work out what they are meant to do with their life is very important. And then finally, this issue of agency. Can I make a difference? In other words, can I do something which will um, help somebody become a better person or live a more authentic life? In other words, what difference can I make? And all of these are rolled together in this question of meaning. So how do we begin to answer that question? I think that the important thing is to talk to people who've thought about this. Because one of the paradoxes is that modern philosophy isn't really very interested in these questions. And yet many philosophers say it ought to be, because they really matter to people. And so in many ways I would say you need to look at writers who have really recognised how important these questions are. And of course it's well understood that the area of human thought and practice which focuses much on meaning is religion. Because in many ways, religion, if you like, one of its big questions is simply, how do we live good lives? What is life all about? And so for me, one of the things that religion contributes to this discussion is an affirmation of the importance of the question. We need to talk about meaning and also begins to explore how belief in God actually provides you with an intellectual foundation for thinking about meaning and actually putting it into practice in life. And what authors do you, do you advise to your students to read? Well, I, I'm British, so for us, um, C.S. Lewis is very important. We, we think he's quite good. But of course, there, there are many other authors you could read who talk about this. Uh, another British writer is G.K. Chesterton. But you will find writers like Thomas Aquinas uh, and others talking about these things. And the important thing is to talk to your friends and ask, who have you read that you have found helpful on these questions? Philosophers like Richard Swinburne, Alvin Plantinga write very well on these themes and of course there are many others as well.